Hello, this is Roman Bartak and I will be the speaker on this tutorial. I wish we could meet in person, but we'll manage it somehow. So, are you ready? Here we go. Welcome to tutorial on compilation-based approaches to planning and scheduling. My name is Roman Bartak and I'm from Charles University in Prague. I divided the tutorial into three parts. In this introductory part, we will cover just the background. I will explain what is a comparison-based approach, and then I will focus on techniques to which we compile, namely SAT and CSP, and I will briefly describe differences between planning and scheduling. In the first main part of the tutorial, I will show you how to solve planning problems using compilation to SAT or CSP. You will see that the core notion will be there to layer the graph. And finally, I will do the same for scheduling models. Uh, and you will see that the core notion there will be a global resource constraint. So let's start with the description of compilation-based approaches. When we use a traditional approach to solve problems, we basically solve the problem and we write a solver for this problem. And the solver returns a solution of that problem directly. The advantage is that the solver can be customized to the problem, but you need to write a solver and you need to maintain the solver. While in compilation-based approach, we are building of expertise of others to solve the problems. So the approach is following. Rather than solving the problem directly, we take our problem P and we compile, translate the problem to another problem Q. And then we can use a solver for that problem Q, which obviously returns a solution for problem Q. So finally, we also need to translate the solution of this problem Q back to solution of problem P. So rather than writing the solver, we focus on this part of translating between the problems and translating between the solutions. Why this approach is useful? Well, because if anybody improves the solver for problem Q, immediately we have a better overall solver for problem P. So there exist other names for this approach, like reduction-based approach or a formulation-based approach. Let me now describe briefly two types of problems to which we are going to compile. Uh, the first one is so-called Wurzdes fibrity problem. This problem is about deciding if a propositional formula in a conjunctive normal form is satisfiable and hopefully also providing its model. So how does the formula look like? We have Boolean variables with true or false possible values, and these variables are connected into clauses, which are disjunctions of these variables or the negations, so-called literals. And finally, the clauses are connected into a formula, which is a conjunction of clauses. And we are looking for instantiation of the Boolean variables satisfying a given formula, and this is the solution. Just to give you an example how the formula may look like, uh, let's look at the formula between the variables x and y. I just use words instead of the classical logical connectics there. If you look more carefully at this formula, you will realize that this formula describes a relation that exactly one of these variables x and y is true. Even within SAP, we can use some form of compilation, meaning we don't need to express everything in a conjunctive normal form, but we can use formulas using higher level description, like implications or the sum of Boolean variables greater or equal than one, which is basically the same as disjunction of these variables, or the sum of variables should be equal one, which means at most one and at least one of these variables equals one. Even if you don't need to write a solver for SAT, it's still good to understand how the SAT solvers are working. And they basically use a combination of depth for search or backtracking and inference realized using so-called unit propagation. Uh, the major algorithm to solve SAT is based on a procedure called DPLL, Davis, Putnam, Lockerman, Lavla. This is the procedure. I'm not going to, into details. It's just a combination of inference, in this case, unit clause propagation and pure symbol propagation with search. And modern SAT solvers are improving this core procedure by adding techniques like detecting the independent components of the SAT formula using random restarts or using clause learning, which can learn new clauses uh, useful to prune the search space. The second technology that we are going to use is a CSP, 
a CSP or a quantity satisfaction problem consists of a set of decision variables. These are the variables describing some features of the world that we are looking for, like the time when activity will execute or position or key in an end screen problem. These variables may be assigned to values that are taken from a domain. Domain for a given variable is a finite set of values and it describes possible options for this variable. And the variables are restricted by constraints, which are relations between sets of variables. These constraints can be expressed in extension using a table, also called tabular or table constraints, or the constraints can be expressed using a formula. This is an example of one typical problem that is solved using CSP. Entwin's problem is the problem of putting n queens to the chessboard of size n times n in such a way that no two queens are in conflict. No two queens are in the same row, column, or diagonal. A typical model uses the following assumption. Each queen must be in a different column. So we put each queen to a different column and we are just looking for a row of the screen. So the variables will describe the rows where each queen is located. And finally, the constraint describes these two remaining conflicts. First, two different queens should be at different rows. That's the first inequality. And two different queens should be at different diagonals. This is the second inequality using the absolute values. And again, how can we solve a CSP? It's very similar to SART. We will be combining search and inference. And now inference will be strongly based on type of constraints we are going to use. Because each constraint can locally remove values that are violating that constraint. Let's look at this example. We have a constraint A is smaller than B, and we have a domain 1 to 5 for both variables. We can immediately see that value 5 cannot be used for variable A because there is no compatible value for B satisfying that constraint. And similarly, value 1 cannot be used for B. So we can remove these values from domains of respective variables. Obviously, there are more constraints than just one. So we can propagate this information about the domains between these constraints. In this example, we have two constraints, A is smaller than B and B is smaller than C, with the same domain as, as above. 1 to 5. So we can first propagate the constraint A is smaller than B. We get the result S in above. And then we can propagate the constraint B is smaller than C, which results to removing values 1 and 2 from the domain of C, but also we remove the value 5 from the domain of B. And now, because the domain of B has been modified, we need to go back to the original constraint A is smaller than B, and we remove the additional value 4 from the domain of A. And now every constraint is locally consistent, but the domains are not yet singleton. We don't have a solution. So we need to use search to resolve the remaining disjunctions. And the search is based on selecting some variable and assigning some value to it, propagating this through the constraints and continuing with other variables. Or if a failure is detected and the domain is empty, we simply backtrack and we try another value. This algorithm is called MAC, maintaining our consistency. And this is how the algorithm looks like. It's combined search, the first search, with constraint propagation. And as you can see, the constraints are critical there because the choice, the selection of constraints, is describing how many values can be removed by local consistency. So that's about the techniques to which we are going to compile. Let's now go to the description of planning and scheduling. So what is planning about? In classical planning, we usually have a description of the current state of the world, and we have some agent. And this agent has a dream about the state of the world that might be different from the current state of the world. This agent has some capabilities described by actions that can modify the state of the world. And what the agent is doing during planning is that it's selecting and organizing the actions in such a way that it will translate the world from the current state to the desired state. In this plan, which is a sequence of actions, you can see that some actions like the pickup C are repeated. So we don't know how many times and if at all the action will be used in the plan. To be more formal, in planning, we are given an initial or current state of the world. We are given a description of actions that are changing states of the world. And we are given a description of the desired state of the world. And the output of the planning system is a plan, which is a sequence of actions that transfer the world from the initial state 
to a goal state, a desired state. What's typical for planning is that we don't know the length of the plan. We don't know which actions will be included. On the other side, we are usually ignoring time, like duration of actions, and we are ignoring resources that we need to execute the actions. Scheduling is a closely related area to planning, but as you will see, it actually solves quite different problem. In, in scheduling, we are given plans. For example, plans how to produce some product. These plans consist of partially ordered sequences of actions. And we are also given resources, like factory in this case, that consist of machines, and each machine can execute one action at a given time. So during scheduling, we need to allocate these actions to resources in such a way that we respect the ordering constraints from the initial plan, and we also respect the capacity constraints for the resources, meaning no resource can produce at, uh, more than one activity at a given time in, in this specific case. So again, to be more formal, in scheduling as input, we are given a set of partially ordered activities, and each activity has a duration, we have a set of available resources like machines and people, and the task is to allocate these activities to specific times when the activity will start and finish, and to specific resources. What is specific for scheduling is that now we know all the activities in advance, and the task is to allocate these activities to limited resources, and frequently also to use limited time for execution of the plan. So that's the end of the initial part of the tutorial.
Let's now talk about how we can solve planning problems by comparison to SAT or to CSP. Just to recall, in planning, the task is to find a sequence of actions that will transfer the world from the initial state to a state satisfying some goal condition. Before we will continue, we need to be more precise about how we describe planning problems. So first, we need to describe how to specify the states. What we will be using a representation is called a multivalued state variables representation. So state will be described as a vector of values of the state variables, and goal state will be specified by giving values of some state variables. Action is then described as a transition from one state to another state, and we will specify precondition of the action as a constraint about specific values of state variables in one state, and the effect will be described as an assignment of values to specific state variables. Perhaps the best way is to show an example. So let's assume a very simple problem with one robot that moves between two locations and there is one container. So we can use two state variables to describe the state. Location of the robot and position of the container. The location of the robot can be location 1 or location 2. The position of the container can be location 1, location 2 or being on the robot. What about the actions? So, for example, the move action moves the robot from one location to another location. So, the location of the robot is in the initial location, and the effect is that the destination location will be assigned to that location variable. And in a similar way, we can describe other actions like loading the container to the robot or unloading the container from the robot. So, now the question is how we can encode this planning problem as a SAT or CSP. There is one major difficulty, and the difficulty is that we do not know how many actions will be in the plan, while the SAT formula or the CSP has a fixed number of variables. So the usual approach that is used there is that we are not looking for arbitrary plan, but for a plan of a given length. And to find this plan, we construct something which is called a layered graph or temporal extended graph, where each layer describes one state and the transitions between two layers describe action that is changing in that state. So it may look like this. So we describe the state of the world. We can encode this as a sub formula or a CSP. And then we describe the next state of the world and again and again. And we connect these states by special constraints that encode the transitions or allow transitions between the states. I will now show you several models how we can do it. All of them are based on one abstract idea, which is we iteratively construct the layered graph and we try to find a plan of a given length. And if we don't succeed, we add one more layer to that graph. So we need to describe uh, this problem as a CSP or as a SAT. So uh, we will have a set of variables describing the state. We know the values of these variables in the initial state because we know the initial state. Then we have an action variable describing which action is applicable. And we have a set of variables describing the next, states, next state. In this case, we don't know uh, the values of them yet. And we can do this for all the layers. And uh, for the last layer, which we supposed to be the goal state, we can set the values of the state variables that we know from the description of the goal state. And now we need to specify the constraints, uh, encoding the transitions of state between the states using the actions. Uh, there are several types of these constraints. We need to describe the precondition of the action by connecting the action variable with certain state variables from the preceding layer. In a similar way, we can describe the effect of the action. We just connect the action with the state variables from the next layer. And we should not forget that we also need to describe that the action is not changing some state variables. So we need to encode the frame axiom. So this is the core model. And then we can find a solution by instantiating the variables, for example, in the backward search style going from right to left. What's interesting is to realize that we can instantiate just the action variables because the state variables will be instantiated by the propagation of the constraint. So the search space will be defined just by the action variables. So this is an abstract model, and let me now show several particular instances of this model. We can encode a very straightforward approach where we directly rewrite uh, preconditions and effects into constraints. It may look like this. So if a, a, an action is assigned to a given action, 
we ensure using the implication constraint that the precondition uh, of that action is true in the, pre in, in the preceding state. And using a similar constraint, we can describe the effect uh, of the action, which will be setting the values in the next state layer. So this is how it will look specifically for our problem with moving robot between two locations. So if we move the robot from location two to location one, then in the previous layer, the robot should be at location two, and in the next layer, the robot will be at location one. About the frame constraint, it's quite simple. If the action is not affecting a given state variable, then we say that the state variable equals to the, state var the same state variable in the preceding layer. But there are several problems with this straightforward formulation. Uh, the major problem is that it uses implication constraints. An implication is basically a syntactic sugar for this junction. And it's known that the adjunctive constraints do not propagate well, meaning they do not prune search the space a lot. So everything must be resolved at the level of search procedure. Moreover, the number of constraints is fairly large. You can see that for every action, there is a constraint in each layer describing the preconditions and effects. And if we have a large number of constraints, each propagation loop will take a lot of time uh, to prune all the inconsistent values using these constraints. So therefore, we suggested a reformulated model, which is based on the idea of encapsulating similar logical constraints into one constraint uh, that will be encoded using a table. And this constraint will describe, for example, the allowed transition. Uh, we just need to be careful about the size of the table. So this is how the table may look like. Uh, it will have uh, column for action variable, then it will have a columns for the state variables from the preceding layer and for the state variables from the next layer. And each line of the table will describe one action. So if you look at the R line, it describes compatible tuples of values where we encode at the same table both preconditions and effects. The empty space in the table means that we don't care about this value, which means we still need to encode the frame constraint and we use the logical constraint that we used before. So this is a reformulated straightforward model. There is another model that we can use uh, based on a graph plan algorithm, but we use the version for sequential planning here. This model uses the idea that for each state variable, we will assign an action that is assigning a value of that state variable. So we will call this action a supporting action variable. And this variable may also include so-called no-op action, which means that the action selected in this time step is not modifying that state variable, so it will use the same value as in the previous layer. Now, how we can encode the constraints? So if action is, uh, has some preconditions, we specified like before about the supporting actions. If the supporting action is changing a specific, is, is setting a specific value of that variable, we set that specific value of that variable. Uh, we also use the frame constraint, which is very simple. If the supporting action is the no op action, then the value of the state variable will be equal to the previous state. And we also need to channel the information between the action variable and the supporting action variables, which can be done this way. If action is affecting, changing a given, given state variable, then the supporting action should be the action selected in that step. If it's not affecting that variable, then the supporting action will be the no op action. Again, this model uses implication constraint, so we can reformulate it using table constraints uh, that encode all the action constraints, and uh, also the channeling constraints can be encoded using the table constraint. Uh, frame constraint is kept again in logical form. So this is the second model, and let's look at another model, which is based on different idea. It uses the idea that rather than modeling the action, we model why a given state variable is assigned a given value. Uh, in some sense, we can say that we merge the effect and frame axioms into a single successor state axiom. So again, if we use logical model, we encode the precondition constraints like before, but rather than effect and frame axiom constraints, we can use a successor state constraint, which says that the value of the state variable will be a given value if and only if an action that is selected is setting this value, or if that value has been used in the previous layer and the action is not modifying this layer. 
So we don't need special, uh, special effect and frame axiom. But again, there are many constraints in, in the form of implication and equivalence. So we can reformulate this constraint model using tables like we did it before. Specifically, the preconditions can be described using one table and the successor constraint using this can be described using other ternary uh, tables. Uh, I will now show you the tables to, to see them more specifically. So uh, we talk about the precondition constraint. So the precondition constraint connects the action and the state variables from the previous layer. It's actually part of the table that we use in the straightforward model. So in this case, we, for example, see that the first action, the moving robot from location one to location two, has one precondition that the robot is at location one and the variable of position for the container does not matter there. About the successor state constraints, there will be two of them because we have two state variables. So this is the successor state constraint for the location of the robot. Uh, we can see that actions move are changing uh, the value of this variable. So we set the new, vari new value of this variable, like location one for action two and location two for action one, and we don't care about the location variable uh, in the previous step. And uh, the other actions, loading and uh, unloading, three, four, five, six, are not changing the state variable, so they will preserve it and so they behave like the no op action. And similarly, we can write a constraint for position of the container. Now there are uh, actions uh, that are loading and unloading the container that are changing the value of that variable. So these are the actions five and six. And the moving action one and two are not changing the value of the position. So they are just modeling uh, the frame axiom. The location of the container is not, is not changed. So how can we compare? these models now. If we just look at the number of constraints, the reformulated models are using much fewer constraints because they encapsulate several logical constraints into several tables. Obviously, we need to duplicate the constraints in the layer for every, every row. Probably what's more interesting to see is what's the runtime comparison of these models. So we take several uh, problems from international planning competition, and this graph compares the runtimes in logarithmic scales for all these models that we discuss. Uh, obviously, the lower the curve is, the better the model is. And we can see that every reformulated model is significantly better than the original model, even if they use the same idea, uh, just different encoding of one. Uh, we call this planner set a sequential planner. Okay, so how we can improve the models further? We may notice that actually planning is about finding synchronized changes of all the state variables. And synchronized changes mean that one action may change several state variables at the same time. We can describe how one state variable is being changed by action using a finite set automata. These are two automata describing the problem uh, from, from our example. So location of the robot and position of the container. So the location of the robot, the automaton on the, on the left, uh, has just two states, location one and location two. Move actions are the only actions that are changing these states, and the, all other actions are encoded in, in the no-op operation here. Uh, the automaton on the right is probably more interesting because there are three states for the position of container, location one, location two, or being on the robot. And again, we can see how load and unload operations are changing. Uh, the states of, uh, of the state variable. We can also see the no op actions, which are describing all actions that are not changing the value of that variable. In this case, the no op will correspond to move actions. And you can also see that in these automata, we can specify what's the initial state for each of these variables. This is the initial value of the state variable. And we can just describe what's the goal value. Uh, in this case, we want to move the container from location two to location one. Uh, and uh, location of the robot uh, is at the beginning at location one, and it does not matter where the robot is at the end. So I mentioned that planning can be seen as a synchronized evolution of these state variables. Uh, 
So this is how uh, the plan may look like. So you can see how the values of uh, the state variables are being changed by the actions. And sometimes we need to synchronization between these actions. Like if we are loading the container to the robot at location two, we require that at, lo at, at uh, the automaton for location of the robot, no op action for location two is used. In this way, we can force the automaton uh, to be in the state of location two, which is the precondition of the, late op uh, of the load operation. And similarly for the unload operation at the end. What's more interesting here is that you can see that we are actually using parallel actions in each step, even if it's not visible here because the parallel action is just a no op action. But in principle, we can use more actions. So therefore, we call the resulting plan a parallel plan. So this is how it's, how it's looking. Uh, we still have state variables like before, but now for each state variable in each layer with an action variable describing the action that is changing the value of that state variable. So now we need to describe the sequencing constraints, which are basically the transition in a corresponding finite state automaton. From one state using a given action, we go to the next state. But this is not enough. We also need to synchronize all these actions because action may have several preconditions and several effects. So if we select an action in one automaton, we need to select the same action in all other automata where this action appears. So this is done using the synchronization constraint. We can also strengthen the model by connecting two subsequent actions. Uh, you may say this is not necessary because in the automaton this is described by the transitions and state, but notice that the actions are using also other state variables. So it might be possible that one action is changing the value of the state variable and the other action, which is using this, this value as a precondition, may not be applied in the next step because it's another precondition is incompatible with another effect of that action. So we can put these additional constraints there. Okay, so how does it compare to the sequential planner? This is the number of problems solved within a given time limit of 30 minutes we can see that the parallel planning is much more efficient. For almost every domain, we can solve more problems. Uh, if we look into more details, uh, we can see that the runtimes are actually significantly better. But we should also say that this comparison is not completely fair because the sequential planner is looking for sequential plans with the smallest number of actions, while the parallel planner is looking for parallel plans where we minimize the number of parallel steps but the number of actions in these steps might be actually larger. So this is what the three columns in the middle are showing. But we can see that the number of actions is not significantly larger uh, for the parallel planner than for the sequential planner. But definitely we can solve much more problems because the number of calls to the solver is much smaller. But now we can improve the pub planner even more. When we look at the model, we realize one simple thing. We don't need the state variables at all. We can model everything just by using action sequencing constraints and synchronization constraints. So we call this model PUP2. And again, if you look at the comparison, PUP2 is even better than PUP because it uses small search space. Uh, the number of variables is much, much smaller there. So the major advantage of PUP over set is using parallel actions. So this is the detailed runtime comparison uh, bet between the models. So about the parallel actions, in our models, we use a very simple semantics called uh, for each step encoding. It basically means that in each step, we can use only independent actions. Actions are independent if they do not use the same state variable in preconditions and effects. If actions are independent, then we can order them arbitrarily. So we just require in each parallel step that preconditions of each action are satisfied in the previous step, and these actions will change certain state variables in the next step. We can do it better by using encoding that allow us to share preconditions. Only the effects of the actions are uh, such that they do not modify uh, preconditions of other selected actions and obviously they do not destroy the effects of, of other actions. So this is called existential step encoding. We can make it even better by allowing even more actions in one layer by so-called relaxed existential step encoding. In relaxed existential step encoding, 
we also allow one action to set a precondition for another action in the parallel step, which means that action whose precondition is not yet satisfied uh, in the previous layer can still be used that if there is another action that sets the precondition of that action. Obviously, it means that now the actions in the parallel steps cannot be used in arbitrary order. There just exists some order of these actions that go from the previous state to the next state. And we can relax it even more by allowing actions to destroy effects of another actions. We just need to be sure that the final effect is applied for the next, next layer. Okay, so in summary, we can solve planning problems by compilation to constraints and satisfaction problems or to SAT. And the core idea is that we will not call the solver just once, but several times by finding plans of a given given length. We can significantly improve efficiency of these models by encapsulating, grouping the constraints into more global constraints. We use the table constraints or tabular constraints there. And because the number of calls to the solver is also important for the efficiency, it's important to decrease the number of calls to the solver, which can be done by allowing parallel actions in each, in each step. But even if, these, even if these improvements are used, unfortunately, the compilation-based planning still do not achieve efficiency uh, of uh, other search-based techniques, mainly due to using advanced search heuristics. So that's all about constraint-based planning.
Okay, welcome back. So let's now talk about how to solve scheduling problems using constraint satisfaction. Just to recall, scheduling task is about allocating known activities to available resources and time, and we need to respect all the resource capacity constraints and precedence constraints. So let's start with a simple example. We have two workers, two resources that are building a bicycle. And we have this graph of activities with partial order between them. So there are 10 activities. Each activity has a specific duration. So in scheduling, we need to allocate these activities to these two resources in such a way that we obtain the shortest schedule as possible. So this is an example of the optimal schedule when we optimize make span. So how we can encode this problem as a CSP? In scheduling, we know all the activities, so the problem is in some sense static, so we can completely encode it as a CSP. What does it mean to encode the problem as a CSP? We need to decide what will be the variables, domains of these variables and constraints. So in scheduling, we deal with time and resource allocation, so we will have active variables for describing position of activities in time and space. For example, for the time allocation, we can use the start time of the activity, or if we need the processing time and end time of the activity. And for resource allocation, we use a resource variable indicating to which resource a given activity is allocated. Regarding the domains, it's quite clear. For the time variables, we have the release times and deadlines for the activities. For resources, we have a set of possible alternative resources if there are any. And about the constraints, they need to describe sequencing between the activities of precedence constraints and resource constraints. So let's now focus more on the constraints part. So if we talk about the temporal constraints, there are two types of them. One is describing the duration of the activity, which can be easily encoded using this simple equation, start time plus processing time equals end time of the activity. And the other type of time relations is sequencing or precedence constraints, which says, for example, that B must be processed before A, which can be easily described using the formula A or B is small or equal to the start of A. Resource constraints are more interesting in scheduling. So this an example of a resource constraints encoding a unary resource, a resource where activities cannot overlap in time. If activities A and B cannot overlap in time, it means that A is before B or B is before A. But this constraint is not very strong and I will show you later much better techniques. So let's speak about resource constraints more. Uh, there are several types of resources, like the unary resources that I already mentioned, meaning uh, at most one activity can be processed at any time. A more general version of the resource is a cumulative resource, where several activities can be processed in parallel if we respect the capacity of the resource. Or even more general type of resource is a producible, consumable resource, where activities produce or consume some capacity of the resource, and we need to keep the capacity of the resource between the minimal and maximum capacity. I will be mainly talking about unary resources, but I will tell a few words about cumulative and producible uh, consumable resources as well. So let's look at the unary resource. I already described the model. Activities cannot overlap in time in unary resource. Um, that's why it's called unary, because it can process at most one activity at a given time. Uh, we will assume that the activities are non-interruptible, or so-called non-preemptible, which means when we start processing the activity, it cannot stop. Uh, there are also interruptible activities, and all the techniques that I will describe can be extended to interruptible activities. So I already uh, described how we can encode unary resource as a constraint. It means that either A is before B or B is before A. That's also the reason why unary resources are sometimes called disjunctive resources. But the problem with this constraint is that it does not propagate very well. So therefore, better techniques to describe unary resources has been proposed. And I will show you one of the most popular, which is called edge finding. So let's assume that we have this problem with three activities, A, B, and C. Durations are in brackets, and each of these activities has a specific time window, for example, 4 to 16 for activity A. And all these activities are allocated to a single unary resource. If you encode it in a disjunctive way, you can see that nothing is happening, meaning no time window is shrink, because A can be before B and B can be before A. Nothing is happening. So let's ask the question, what happens if activity A is not processed first in that resource? It means that we need to start with either B or C, and because B is probably the earlier one, we can start with B, and then we need to allocate C and A after 
But as we can see, there is not enough time to do it if we do it in the order BCA. If we use the order BAC, there will be not enough time to do C. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that A must be actually processed first in that resource, which in other words means that B and C are processed after A. So we can use this information to shrink the time window for A because the maximum time of A is now 7 instead of 16. This type of filtering can be described formally using inference rules like this one. Just to explain it, uh, A epsilon, sorry, omega is the set of activities and A is the activity that we are trying to allocate in that resource as well. So if we don't start with A, then we will start with something from omega. So we take the earliest start time, EST of omega, and we make a difference between this earlier start time of omega and the latest completion time, LCT, of omega extended by A. And if this distance is smaller than the processing time P that we need to process omega and A, we know that A must be the first one, meaning A must be before omega. We can design the same rule or similar rule uh, for uh, the using that A must be after omega. And now when we know this information that A is before omega or after omega, we can shrink the time window for A in the following way. If A is before omega, we can take every subset of omega, omega prime, and we can calculate its uh, latest start time which is done by taking the latest completion time of omega prime minus the processing time for activities in omega prime. And we take the minimum of these because A must be before all of these omega. And similarly, if A is after omega. If we implement this technique in a naive way, it means that we need to explore all these sets of omega and omega prime. So we will actually get exponential algorithm which is not what we want because exponential uh, time complexity can be done through search. But we don't need to explore all of these activities to achieve the same pruning. The nice thing is that we can explore just the task intervals defined by two activities, X and Y. And task interval are basically all activities C, which are located between the start of X and the end of Y. And if we apply the above inference rule to task intervals only, we get exactly the time pruning as if we apply it to every set omega. So we can achieve the time efficiency, uh, which is n to the power of 3. And this is the frequently used approach to implement edge finding rules. But actually, we can do it even better. There are algorithms with, uh, with square time complexity or even n log n time complexity, which is very good because this algorithm is called during search. So this is about edge finding, which is applied to solve uh, unary resource constraints. There are other techniques for unary resources like not first, not last. Uh, and this technique can also be extended to cumulative resources. Well, other type of filtering techniques are used either timetable constraint or energetic reasoning. Let me just briefly sketch the idea of cumulative resource and its filtering. So this is a graph that shows the capacity of the resource at each time. Uh, some capacity is already used. And now we have an activity with its time window, and we can use information about how the resource has been used before to prune the time window, because we can see that at the beginning, there is not enough capacity uh, to run the activity. So this is the idea of, of timetable constraint. About the producible consumable resources, there are techniques like ORP, PRP filtering, optimistic resource profile, pessimistic resource profile. They are basically working like this. So let's assume we have a resource with capacity two, and we have three activities that are consuming this resource. So these are the triangles pointing down, and we know the sequence of these activities. And there is also one activity that is producing this resource, the triangle pointing up with the plus one symbol. But we don't know where this activity is located. From looking at this resource, at this resource we can deduce that this uh, projection activity must be somewhere between the first consumption and the last consumption. Because if it's before the first consumption, we will exceed the maximum level of the resource. If it's after the last consumption, we will go below the zero level of the resource. So this was the idea of resource constraints. What about the alternative resources? Sometimes we can allocate the activity to several resources. The trick that is used in modeling is that for each activity, we use a duplicate or sometimes optional activity that participates in 
resource constraints for a specific resource. Okay? And then we can combine information from these duplicate activities to uh, the time window of the original activity. If we obtain a failure for a given activity in a given resource, it just means that the activity cannot be allocated to that resource. So we can simply delete it from uh, the domain of the resource, resource variable. Okay. So let me now show how is it working uh, using some filtering, filtering rules. So basically, we duplicate the activity, we put it to dedicated resources where they participate in the filtering procedures, and then we collect the information back to the original activity. Perhaps rather than looking at inference rules, an example will show how is it working. So we have the activity A with the time window like this, and we have three resources, R1, R2, and R3, where this activity can be allocated. So we duplicate this activity to three activities that will participate in, let's say, unary resource constraints for these resources. And it may happen that is in resource R1, the only available time window for that activity is like this one. In resource R2, it's like this one. And in resource R3, it's like this one. So now we know this information from resources and we can propagate these time windows back to the original activity. So we can say, yes, activity A can be processed in one of these resources, but only in this time window. So that's how we can model alternative resources in constraint-based scheduling. So let's now speak about how we can influence search. So when we do the modeling, we just describe constraints, but we can also describe how the search procedure should work for this specific model. So we can describe branching scheme with solving the original, the, 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 the remaining disjunctions. In traditional scheduling, the, the suggestion is that critical decision should be done first, meaning resolve bottlenecks like bottleneck resources first, and then you can do the rest. This somehow reminds the fail first principle used in constraint programming. So let's now focus on this. Uh, the idea is that when we select the critical resource and we have options, we should go into direction that gives us more flexibility. So this is again uh, the same the principle that is used in constraint programming as a succeed first principle. So now the question is how we can describe these notions of criticality and flexibility more formally. And this is where the notion of Slack is used. So Slack is a formal description of flexibility of the schedule. So let's assume that we have two activities and we know that one activity is processed before the other activity. So Slack is basically the free time we have to move these activities in time. So let me show an example. We have these two activities A and B with these time windows, and we may assume that A is before B. So the Slack is to shift any of these activities. So it's the time between these two activities. So formally, we can describe Slack for the ordering of activities by taking the latest completion time of the second activity minus the earliest start time of the first activity and minus the processing time of both activities. If the order of activities is not specified, the Slack is defined as a maximum Slack of both of these orders. And if we have a group of activities, then the Slack is defined by simply taking the latest completion time uh, uh, minus the earliest start time of these activities, and we also remove the processing time of these activities. So how the Slack is used during search? During search, we need to order the activities. A is before B or A is not before B. And the first question is, which pair of activities should be selected for this branching? And obviously, it should be the most critical pair using the fail first principle. And the most critical pair is such pair of activities where we have the minimum slack. So we select the pair, and now if we are deciding whether A is before B or vice versa, we select the more flexible order. So again, we select the, the order where the slack is maximum. So as we can see uh, in constraint-based scheduling, we can not only design the constraint model, but we can also influence the search strategy, okay? So let's go to summary. Constraint-based scheduling is a very powerful technique to solve scheduling problems. I would say it's the technique to solve scheduling problems. The reason is that it's based on strong resource constraints that encode all scheduling wisdom and encapsulates it in a constraint that can be combined with other constraints. 
Moreover, in, in once in base scheduling, we can also use scheduling heuristics within the search procedure so we can influence efficiency of the search. If you want to know more about constraint based scheduling, I can definitely recommend the book Constraint Based Scheduling. It's quite old, but it describes the principles very nicely. And that's all. Thank you for your attention.